Hello and welcome here in the auditorium at Extreme Events. Today we have our demo days, so we are looking into the various products from our portfolio and this session is about workflow orchestration. With me here in the auditorium, remotely connected, is John from Squared Paper. Hi, John. Hello, Stefan. How are you? I'm fine. Now, before jumping into actual demo, let me give you a little bit of an idea. So Squared Paper is our partner for all the workflow orchestration topics from Reading in England. And their solution is called Busby. What is Busby? So if we look at it, it is a toolkit. Um, it is a framework for not only developers, also for end customers to create solutions. And these solutions are created by a centralized service bus to connect to various microservices. Microservices that are delivered with the system and services that are connected via microservices from other parties. So there is like an inbuilt uh, user authentication, there is a user interface uh, for the operators to work with, we will see that in a moment. There is functionality to run, run, run job lists, so and there's a scheduler application to do live controls, we will see that as well, and obviously the connections to various third parties. John is our specialist and he will talk about things in detail. Um, I just want to give you the high-level intro. Um, John, I would say let's jump right away into the topic. Now, yes. let's put ourselves into the seat of one of our customers. And let's assume he is running a file-based workflow. And uh, obviously, often that is started with, a, let's say, a watch folder. Could you please show us how someone would kick off a workflow by yeah, putting something into a watch folder? Certainly. Um, I'll just quickly show you very briefly how you set up a watch folder because that's, um, and we'll come back to that in more detail. Yeah, very but, true. Thank you. Um, but this is useful to, to a quick overview. So here you can see the, the web based configuration editor. And I'm going to kick off a job in the QC and transcode workflow. And there's several ways you can kick off a job. One might be uploading a file from the user interface or an FTP. But in this case, we're going to use a watch folder. So I can click on here, and I can see the location I need to drop the files into. So I will go ahead and do that. Um, I will also log into the, the main user interface and go to the Trello board. So what I'll do is, um, because I'm only sharing my browser, I can't actually show you uh, what I'm doing. But I'm simply doing a file copy command. Um, and I'm going to copy a video file, a demo video file, into the watch folder. If I do that now, um, yeah. then we should see in a second it would be picked up by the folder monitor and it will start to make its way through the, through the workflow. I think our audience can easily imagine because they all do this every day. And here it is exactly. already the first job. And that brings me to my next question. So how would an operator then follow the workflow? How can he monitor and interact with the job that was created just now? So you can see here um, we've got this Trello-like user interface. Um, here's the named QC and Transcode. So this particular workflow that we've got set up um, is to take in a file into a watch folder, um, do an automatic QC using vanilla Pulsar, um, and then it does a transcode if, if the QC uh, passes. Um, and what you have here is you have various strips um, in, the, in this user interface, and each one of these strips represents a state in a workflow or a group of states. Um, and that, this is configurable how you want to set up this um, user interface based on how detailed your operators need to see things. For example, you could have this one for the operators, which has a list of all the different steps. And you might have an overview view for your customers where they might just see the jobs in the queue, the jobs that are doing and the jobs which are done. And they may not care about the individual mm. steps in the meantime. But so there's other things... Looks so, to me a little bit like um, instead of a vertical queue that we know from lots of other applications, we have more like a horizontal view here, but we can get also the details about the various yes, exactly. tasks so if I find the, the job. Exactly. So if I just find the view that 
that we the, the job I just put through, as you can see, I've been using the same. Everyone knows about Big Buck Bunny because this is the open source uh, video. So if I click on to one of these cards, um, I can then interact with this job in a few different ways, depending on the permissions I have. Uh, this user has all the permissions. Um, you can always, so you click on the job and it brings up this card and you always have this notes view. So you can always add a note to the job and this uh, is simply visible to anyone. There's no permissions on the notes, that's perfectly fine. Um, so that that's easy for anyone to found, see later on. Then if I click on the state history, I can see the various states that the job went through and at what time the, the transition between the states happened. So you can see the initial state here was the queue of the auto QC, then it did the auto QC, then it went to the transcode queue. And if you click on any of the states where there's a little flag icon, it means if you click on there, there's some more information that will um, be provided at the right. So every, I think it's every five seconds, it will update the progress. And it's, it's like a, a little bit of a, a small log here. So you can see the status of it going through the Pulsar QC. And it went to transcode. Then it was done. And then we have some other tabs along the top of here. Um, and these are called info blocks. Um, and the way these work is, at any point in um, the workflow, you can attach uh, some metadata to the job, um, and we call those info blocks. And they're simply blocks of um, under the hood, it's JSON, but in the content of that, you can put anything you want. You could put a file, you could put some XML, just some text. Um, and these are stored against the job, and they can then be accessed by any other scripts um, or services later on in the workflow. So what that means is um, we don't have to pass metadata between one from one step to the next. We simply attach it to the job, mm -hmm. and that can be accessed later on. So if I look at this transcode info block, this is simply just some JSON. Um, and in this case, we've just put the URL um, of the the preview on the Cambria FTC. And that's that's the reason that's there. Is because as you saw as it was going through the transcoding, it was updating the thumbnails um, in the in the view. We've got some information about the watch folder. Here we've attached a file, um, so we've got the PDF report. And if I download that, you can see the the QC report that came out of Venera. Um, and then simply a few other information blocks. We've got the the QC report as JSON because could in other workflows be used to display that as a timeline and just a little bit of status. Yeah, so in this if case, the, the job has passed all the steps without any exactly. error found in the video. So bad luck for us not being able to show a violation in the quality control. No. But could you tell us how would it be displayed if something goes wrong in that workflow in terms of Let's say an exception is thrown, like quality does not, is not for sufficient. I may not enter the next step, the transcoding in this case. Uh, so the way that works is simply we just, in this case, we've made an extra state in the workflow. It's probably helpful if I just quickly refer to the workflow configuration again. Um, and over here we have another state. Um, I know I'm jumping around a bit here, but you can see the script which does the automatic um, QC, we simply have these different exit codes um, to say whether the job passed or failed. So in this case, if it passes, we're going to exit with code zero in the script. And if it fails, we're going to go with code two. And that refers to these different routes um, down here in, in the workflow. And what we've actually done, actually, I think this is warning and red and red is failed. And what we've done is if anything went to warning, then we put it into a manual QC state uh, where somebody like a supervisor needs to check the file and see if they're going to pass it or they're going to reject it. So you can see that quite easily you can put in some different logic and decide if something's going to go one route down the workflow um, or another. So is there a difference in between, let's say it goes a road left or right and a real error has occurred, so something has failed in the processing? Or is it always catched within the workflow orchestration in the one or the other way? Um, so in general, 
most of the errors are, are caught, but and and some. But you never know um, with software if everything's going to work perfectly or if something's going to go wrong that's unexpected. So if something does happen that's unexpectedly, um, what we can do is uh, we can have a um, – let me just find it. You can have an exception step, which you put into your workflow, um, and you tick this default exception step. And what that means is anything that goes wrong, any errors that were thrown mm. that you haven't caught in your code, any, in any scripts or processes in the workflow, they will end up in this step here. And this step in turn itself is a little script. So you can decide how you want to handle those uh, unwanted exceptions. For example, you may just exit and it will go to the error step. Or you might decide you want to send an email or an SMS or something like that. So it's, it's flexible on how you want to handle your uh, expected or unexpected errors. So... We've jumped right away into the details of that workflow, but probably we should give our audience a yes, quick sorry. idea of what this all of our workflow is about. We called it QC and transcoding, a very simple example that we thought might be very useful to explain the system. Um, we've seen the front end, we've seen the details in the workflow, but probably you want to give us a little bit of a high-level overview. Yes, so I'll do a quick high-level overview of this workflow. And actually, I'll just talk briefly about Busby itself as well. Um, The, the way Busby works and the way it's put together is it's actually, a, instead of being a product, it's more of a toolkit. Um, and it come, it's basically a collection of, of services which you can use to build up your, your system. Um, so in this case, this, work, this workflow gives you a drag and drop view to make the workflows. And you can drag in different steps, um, a mixture of manual and automatic steps. And the automatic steps... Uh, probably 90% of the time, a small script, maybe 20 lines or less. And the reason we have gone down the script route instead of trying to have a different node for every single type of, um, let's say, device you want to, to use is it was we initially tried to have different nodes for everything at first, but you can only catch maybe 90% of the functionality that each customer is going to want to do. So what we've concentrated on instead is making the helper and the scripting functions really easy to use and really easy to discover what you need to put inside the script. Um, so that's how you build up your workflows. Um, now, the way it works is where I've got here, buzzfeed.autoqc.pulsar.check, what that's going to do is that's going to um, where I've got down here my drivers, um, that knows, because I've set up a driver for the, the Pulsar system mm -hmm. on there, here I, you can see I'm giving the simply the IP address is the only configuration it needs, but you may need to put another path and maybe some credentials um, in other systems. Um, but because I've put that in there, plus this configuration tool knows that this is an auto QC driver. So when I then start to type busby or auto QC and I do a dot, it will list me any auto QC drivers I have in this list, and I can select one, and then I can do check, and I simply need to pass it the profile ID and the file path here with some extra backslashes because it's a Windows computer. And you can give it a couple of options. You can give a description to the job, um, and you can give a path to the report where you want it to output its PDF report to. And then here, similarly, this is the path to where the, the job report is on this Busby server. But yeah, so a, sim a quite, I'm sorry, I've gone into detail again, um, but the, um, the concept of this workflow is it's quite simple. We go through an auto QC. If it passes, we go straight to transcode. If it's a warning, we go to manual QC. And then after the transcode, We simply go to done. Um, I, you would probably have some other steps to to handle a transcode failure in, in a real system um, and handle those to errors. So that's that's a high level overview of the workflow and a brief overview of Busby. Thanks, John. I think it's of interest for our audience also to understand a little bit more in detail how such a workflow is created. We cannot uh, create the whole workflow here in this session, but. Probably you can start with us a little bit from scratch and can show 
the people, how the first two, three of these building blocks are yeah, orchestrated. Because as you explained, it's more than just drag and drop. It's a little bit of a scripting. And I would like the people to understand that it's not that difficult. They can easily manage that. Sure. Okay. So um, I'll simply then, in my configuration of the Joe, I'll, I'll head down to workflows and I'll create a new workflow. Mm -hmm. I'll just call this um, IBC workflow because this is a little bit of IBC. Um, so let's say in this case, you don't want to use a watch folder. You might want to have someone triggering um, a job via an API, for mm -hmm. example, and that's very easy to do. You simply, in this case, we're going to start with a message monitor. Um, you have to set up a few things when you start the start of a workflow. You have to make sure you have a script step service. Um, and a script step service is simply the service which will run this script here. Uh, and this is the script that starts the job. Um, you can decide if you set these up with multiple script steps per workflow, or you can have one for the whole workflow, depending on how you want to set up your system. Um, there's two types of uh, message monitor in this case. Um, you can either do HTTP, which ex which built in then exposes a little uh, HTTP API, or you can do ESB, uh, which means you're going to listen to a status message. So any other Busby service which sends out a specific message name, um, you can put that in here, and that would also trigger the, the job in a workflow. Another common example um, is people who want to um, trigger actions from an alarm. So you can simply here have an alarm monitor, um, and you can select the alarm service you want to trigger the message from. Um, but anyway, I'll go back to um, message monitor. John, just a quick yeah. question. Is it fair to say that the script step is the kind of the workflow stepper engine? So yes, that is definitely true. So the script steps are responsible for what they do is when they start up, um, based on, uh, let me just drag it one in to explain myself. Um, let's call this script starting. Um, so what happens is after this script has run and it's created the job in the workflow, the job will then be in the state of starting. It will be in the queue of when you have an automatic step in, in mm. Busby. I think it's, I know it's a bit of detail, but it's important to, to point this out because it's a useful thing to know. Under the hood, when you go and publish the configuration, um, the state store, which is the, the workflow engine, actually creates two states. It has a, a starting step and it has a starting queue and you don't need to add the queue in here it adds it for you what that means is this message monitor would have picked up the message from the http api created a job and the state of the job will be starting queue mm, i see um, so what that means is because you may have multiple let's say this is a busy system you might have multiple script steps configured running on multiple hosts because you want to um, get some more processing power and get through through quickly. Um, and then how that works is the, the multiple scripts steps will be connected to the state store and they will all be listening for um, a job created message coming from the state store or they'll be waiting to see uh, there's a job here which has come into one of the states which I'm interested in and then it will go and ask if it can have the lock for that job Whichever one gets there first will win, and then it will start processing um, that job. Um, so that's yeah, that's that's how that um, works. So then, what I'll do here is quickly show you. Um, you, I think it's important to point out that it's quite easy to do the scripting. Um, so let's say there's a couple of things you can do. Probably most of the time. When you're uh, doing a script in Busby, you're going to want to, uh, first of all, go and get an info block, which might be attached to the job, and it might just be um, the location of a file which the, the watch folder has picked up, or it may be the, the contents of the HTTP message. So, But you're going to need that 
to know in your script to save as a variable so you know what to, to do with it. So let's just do something like um, equals. Um, and then you'll see here, if I go to Busby dot, um, you'll see that it starts filling things in and suggesting things I can type. Now I can do state store dot, and then here you can see it brings up the different things you can do. I want to go and do, um, let's say I'm going to do a get file info. And when I open my brackets, um, you can tell it gives you the parameters you need to fill in. I'm going to call that watch folder, for example. And what that's doing is it means it's going to ask the state store um, for the info block which is attached to this job and there's a subtype of the types and subtypes of info block and it's going to ask for the file type and the subtype watch folder and it will return me the contents of that as as a json which i can then use in in my script um, so let's say i want to do um something like source file equals let's just do file info let's say it's called file name for example that we've attached on there then now i've got this file name and i've got this from the state store um i can then do let's say i want to run a media info and, and see get some information about the file because i'm going to then make a decision on which transcode profile i'm going to use so let's say um Media info, and I'm sure you, you can also maximize this. Um, and we can do, for example, busby.media info.run, uh, and then I'm going to give it source file as a parameter. All right, let's say I want to know if it's um, what could we find out? How many audio tracks I've got in the file? Then I can do something like some audio tracks. Media info dot get number of audio tracks. But you can see that it's built in quite quickly with, um, well, actually, because I've put spaces and line breaks in here, I've put four lines of code and I found out the number of audio tracks um, in the file that's just been uploaded. So you can see that it's it, quite quickly you can get your logic going. Mm -hmm. So this starting step is way more than just. Uh, the start of a queue, it's uh, the preparation of the workflow job that happens then next. Exactly, yes. Um, then let's say, uh, let's add one more step, uh, probably the transcoding. Um, sure. Yeah, in this particular case, it might make sense to, for instance, transcode to a transport stream with uh, yeah, a number of audio tracks that depend on the uh, source audio tracks that have been delivered to. Sure, so there's a few different, let's just call this... Um, oh, and one thing I may do here is before I go to my next script, I might do um, state store, and I'm going to then update JSON info. And I'm, I'm adding or updating an info block. Mm -hmm. Call it transcode profile, and then I'll put some JSON here, which is profile ID one two three or something. And then in the transcoding, there's a there's a, Lots of different options. Um, let's say um, either you can use, for example, a, a Canva or FTC transcoder, or let's say you just want to do something really basic um, and you want to make a browse file or something, mm -hmm. then built in, there's helper functions for that as well. So I can do something like transcode dot, and then it's got my functions in here. For example, I can um, add an output file. And I have to give it the, the output file and say temp. Um, and then after I've done that, I can carry on basically doing a dot and I can add other things to it. Like um, I can set the aspect ratio, um, let's say 16 by 9. Then I can set the audio bit rates. Let's say I want to do 128 kilobits. Um, and what I can also do is I can do a send Busby progress, and I can give two numbers, 
a start percentage and an end percentage. And that means when it's doing the transcode, those are the numbers it will go between when it's making a progress bar. Um, and the reason you might want to set that differently from zero and 99 is, let's say the transcode may just be a small part of your script and you just want to send the progress for that. And then typically at the end, um, you just do dot do transcode. So again, if I was doing this in FFmpeg, uh, it would be quite a long command line and it would take me a while to work out what all the parameters are, uh, but it's got all that information and it's got all those functions built in um, and does it for you. I think it brings it back us right now to what we've started with, uh, to the way how an operator would monitor it. Uh, let me ask you, are those three steps, four steps, are immediately exposed to the user interface or is there something that we need to do that they are showing up as columns in our Trello board style user interface? So, good question. They're not immediately shown up. I'm just going to quickly add another, another one, which is done. Um, and obviously I won't actually put something through this workflow, but I can show you how quick it is to make a board. So then, yeah, you need to add a board. You can either add these states to an existing board if you may have, a, say you have a group of workflows doing similar things and mm. you want to monitor them in the same place, um, or perhaps you don't, so you make a new board. Um, let's... There's a few things you have to set up. You to state store. Um, some of these are optional. Resource group is not relevant on this particular board. You can, in this card layout, um, if you want to, you can put some JSON in here, and that allows you to um, format the way these cards are, are displayed. So by default, there's always a, um, it gives you the file name and the, let's say, the, the um, internal reference. Uh, but you can change that and you can put tags and colors and all sorts in these if you want to make your board uh, nice to use for your operators. But quite simply, all I need to do down here is make some strips. So let's so say I want to call this um, transcode Q. I had a strip here. I call it. I, and when I start typing, you can see all the steps in all the different workflows. Um, that you can select. So I'm going to go for transcode queue in the IBC workflow. Now let's say I have another script step, transcoding. Okay, so I'm just going to select the transcode. And simply, I'm going to have one for done. Um, so that means then, um, so we're almost there um, to expose that to user interface. What we have to do now is simply go to our selector configuration now selector is the um the web framework so this is selector here and it's presenting all the different applications which are available uh, based on what you've configured here so i've set up some folders which make these drop downs um so let's say i want to put this inside the workflow monitoring tar drop down um then i simply need to publish my configuration um Oh, I've done something, and it tells you what you've done wrong when you try to publish. Exactly one initial state needs to be defined in the workflow, and the reason that's errored is because in here I haven't set. Um, I need to on one of my states. I need to tick the initial state, which means the state that it will start at when you create the job in in the workflow. Um, so let's try that again. Get to put a comment in when you publish, and now. If I go to the user interface and refresh that, you don't need to restart any services to add this to the user interface. Let's just log in. And you can see here that there's my IBC transcode board. Oh, yeah. And if I was to put some track jobs through there, then there we go, they would appear in there. Cool. So, yeah. I see there's quite a bit of an effort that you need to put into create such boards, but uh, it's all in the hands of the yeah, administrators that have a little bit of a scripting capabilities uh, to create whatever their customers, their operators require. Exactly. It's, yeah, it's quite flexible and you can 
yeah, using a few lines of code, you can generally get something up and running quite quickly, um, as you can as you can see there. Um, and the the other workflow I was going to show you um, later on, touch which we'll touch on. I think we briefly spoke about scheduling, and I'll show you something related to that uh, in a bit. But just to give you an idea, um, I was able to come onto this the system this morning, and I spent maybe half an hour 40 minutes setting it up um with a few small bits of configuration and it's working already so it, just once you get used to using it it you'll quickly find that you'll be able to get things up and running pretty easily mm. john you already tipped on it um there is the let's say the other half of the type of use cases that busby is uh, made for and that is uh, beside all the file-based operations the live operations so where we have more like real-time scheduling applications. Um, time is too short to show how this is all being created, but I think you can show us the one or the other uh, real-life example from your other customer cases. So you would like to introduce us a little bit into how such a live orchestration workflow is yeah, created. That's not a workflow. Live orchestration sure, so well, give you and how it's operated. Sure, I'll just I'll try to be quick. So I know we haven't got much time, but um, what I've done here in the, in the systems, I've got another workflow uh, which I've called scheduled recordings. And this is a very basic example of how you could set up, let's say, scheduled ingest or scheduled lines record. Uh, maybe it's on an IP encoder uh, or an SDI encoder. Simply using the tools here, but adding some scheduling around it. So I made a very basic workflow which has got a few steps. I've got scheduled. I've got a script which will start the recording. In that, in that case, it will go and um, contact the uh, driver for the encoder. Maybe it would be an elemental encoder or, a, um, or some other encoder. Um, then I've got a, a manual state or a tally state for recording in progress, so you know that it's in progress. Another script to do the stopping, another state so it's finished. So I've made a very basic workflow there. Then there's a service inside the system called the diary service. Um, and you can add this on. And what this does is it adds some timed process, uh, time states moving um, around the state store. So simply its, its job is to, um, when you've scheduled something, um, it simply moves it into a different workflow state at the specified time. Mm -hmm. And then all the work of starting the recording or doing the router switch or whatever is done inside the workflow scripts or the workflow services. So it keeps that nice and clean and simple. So in here, you simply have to set up the name of your workflow, the, the start state of your workflow, the stop state, and any exceptional archives. But this start and stop, that can be um, any state you want. And it might be that during the process, while your event is, let's say, live, because it, the, the diary service says this is event is currently on now, you may have a whole massive workflow with loads of complicated things happening, like setting up routers, setting up vision mixers, all sorts inside the workflow. And then at the end, it will simply go into the stop. So what I've done, um, and this is going to be briefly, we'll show you another thing we've got, which allows you to create little databases um, inside the system when we use something called resource groups. So if I click down here, um, you can see this is very basic editor here and this allows me to set up a little database and in this case i've made two tables one called encoder and one called source you can put as many columns as you want in these um, tables um, and link them through to other tables and it gives you if i go to here um, and go to my scheduled recording drop down and i've made a uh, then it comes with a user interface um, and it just gives you a little grid. So in here you can see I've just put a coder name as one a coder in as one table with one column called name and source with one column called name. Um, you probably would have more, lots of things in here like the ID, the IP address or and things like that. Um, but I've just done to be simple for this demo. In, then it provides you with this user interface. Um, which you can then add and you can edit things. So I've set up here some router sources um, and some encoders, one to six. Um, then when I go to um, the scheduling user interface, 
you can see that uh, there's some events scheduled here currently. Um, let's see if I just quickly go to the schedule recording boards. You can see in progress, we have Frankfurt versus Bayer Leverkusen and Bayern Munich versus Dortmund. Those are events which are currently being recorded um, on the encoder. And what that means is at the time when they started, if I go to diary, you can see at 1300, that would have then moved in. And you can see in the state history here, um, it was a little bit late because this system has not got any uh, time code in, into it. Um, but you can see that went into the start recording queue and then got started processed to be processed via the workflow. Um, and but then, so that gives you an overview of your scheduled jobs, um, and you can also drag them out if you want to end them early. But if I go to this, the, the scheduling user interface as well, you've got this little calendar view. Uh, these are all jobs in the workflow that have been scheduled. So if I click around, hover over this, for example, um, you can see the details of the event um, that's outside source two. Um, and one thing I forgot to to mention is when you configure your resources um, in here, if I go to the resource scheduling service, you can co configure roles in here. So I've made um, two roles here, two booking types, sorry. I've got a recording type. And in here you can say how many of each type of resource you need. So I've said here, I want to have one source and one encoder. But I've made another type of booking, which I've called main backup recording. And I've said again, I need one source. But I need to have two encoders. Um, and here you can just set up the colors of what they're going to view in this interface. And then what that means is um, you can simply add bookings up here using this form. This is ma mainly a basic form for testing and debugging. The main power that this gives you um, is to do things from a workflow or from an API, you can send in, in a request to say, I want to schedule um, a type of um, main backup recording, and I want to use source one in encoder slots two and three. Um, and then when you try to add the booking, um, it, depending on how you've configured it, it will also do a class check, and it will check if any of, any of those resources are in use at that time. It will say, no, I can't do that. Um, or it will return and say, yes. Um, you can do that. Uh, and to help you make a kind of scheduled workflow, there's, there's various drivers built in for things like encoders. Um, there's a router controller, so you can, you can have a router panel and, and things like that, all built in um, to the system. Um, and then you get presented with this user interface for a quick overview um, to, to see what your, your scheduled uh, jobs are. So to me, it sounds a little bit like you use Busby to yeah, create workflows that behave more like a state engine. And within that state engine, you trigger the individual states by time, timed events. That, at the end of the day, creates a live control scenario. Exactly. John, unfortunately, we are running out of time. It would be great to listening to you way more. But um, yeah, if you like, please make contact with us. We can schedule individual demos to talk about your exact use case to demonstrate how it can be implemented with Busby. Always happy to do so. Thank you so much, John, for joining us this afternoon here at Extreme Events. And thank you so much for thank everyone you. who was listening to us.